proudly brought to you by Investment Solutions with Confidence. On the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. It's Tuesday, June the 18th. It's a lunchtime, so most of the traders are drifting off. But it would be quiet anyway, despite the fact the market has had a nice rally with the S&P up at 16.50 and the Dow Jones essentially 15,300. If you cast your mind back to what happened in March 2009, this was a completely different place. The market was on its knees and traders were fearful. The Dow Jones, for example, was between six and six and a half thousand. I can't remember the exact number, but anyway, when you consider that today it's 15,300, we've had a 250 percent rally. It's been the most extraordinary rally. And it's been prompted, of course, by the fact that the market was oversold, but also by the fact that we've had the most expansive and dramatic policy when it comes to fiscal and monetary in the history of the United States of America and in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. But of course, the, while that is a thing of great beauty, the ugly sister in all of this is the US economy. The US economy has lagged. And in fact, according to some metrics, the US economy has, has the most anemic post-recession recovery in the history of the United States of America. So something's got to give. As we speak now, everyone's waiting for Ben S. Bernanke of the US Federal Reserve. The FOMC is meeting as we are speaking now. And tomorrow, at around about 2.15 New York time, there will be a decision. It's the most eagerly awaited decision in recent FOMC history. Who knows what's going to happen? We're going to go up to the members gallery in a moment and speak to a trader to get his views. I'm here in the members gallery of the New York Stock Exchange on a quiet day before Mr. Bernanke speaks. We already know what the answer is to that. Well, you will when you see this. But anyway, let's have a chat to Michael Gooley from Knight Capital Americas. He's on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Michael, what that man says will sort of define the fortunes of the exchange. For the ensuing future, yes. What he comes out and says will affect the market going forward. You know, a couple of weeks ago, he hinted, or him and his committee hinted at increasing interest rates um, and even uh, limiting his buyback program going forward. And we saw a tremendous pullback in the market. I think it was a 200-point move. So what they say, or even what they hint to say, will certainly have an impact on, uh, on the market. It's very, very quiet. It's almost eerily quiet, as though people are sort of fearful about what he might say. If he says something good for the market, will the market go up? If he says something bad for the market, will it go down? Or if the market has made up its own idea about where it wants to go, will it just do it anyway? I think you make a very valid point that it will probably do what it wants to do anyways, um, regardless of uh, whether his actions are uh, viewed rightly or wrongly. Um, it could be easily misinterpreted as to what he's doing and how the market should react to such. So uh, I've seen it many times where they'll say one thing, the market will quickly uh, move to one, one side and then realize, hey, this is not the cor correct reaction and eventually um, go the other way instead. What Ben Bernanke did say on the 18th of June 2013 was that the Federal Reserve could start slowing its economic stimulus program later this year. Let's go back to March 2009. This place must have been very, very nervous, even more uh, sort of nervous than it is now. March 2009, the Dow Jones was, what, six, six, six to six and a half thousand? Sure. Something like that. Looking across there now, here we are, 15,200 and... 95, that's a 250% gain, something like that. Do you think it's all because of Bernanke? Obviously, it was oversold, but maybe Bernanke has been attributable to the last maybe 20, 30%? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you look at the company's performance over that time frame, the companies have become leaner, meaner, uh, and profitable at the same time. So I think that speaks a lot to the businesses themselves showing up profitability. And I'm sure that's had uh, most of the um, reason for why the market has has gone higher is merely their performance. But certainly uh, when you have these lower interest rates or effectively zero interest rates that Bernanke has mandated, that um, this recent move is probably a result of that. For years, borrowing rates in the US have been kept very low owing to the Fed's extraordinary economic stimulus programs. But once these start to taper off, rates will inevitably rise. 
They do say that you only really miss something when it's gone. Do you think we're going to miss quantitative easing when it's either tapered or withdrawn completely? Is it a dangerous situation, do you think? It's going to be challenging to do this without generating a lot of volatility. I think the Fed is very focused on that question, and no doubt they, they will learn, as you know, we do, as to how to do this better. I think there are you know, positive examples here. So everyone, of course, remembers 94 as you know, bond market volatility, and that's the bad example. The good example is actually 2004 to 2006, when we moved the, you know, the federal funds rate was started at 1%, and it you know, sort of ended up you know, well north of 5 and during that period, the Fed was quite successful at tightening monetary policy without generating uh, a huge amount of volatility. Now, some would argue that they were actually did the job too well, and they actually that stability contributed to the financial crisis we had. And I, I, I would agree with that to some degree. But I think it suggests, if nothing else, that there, you know, one shouldn't presume that the Fed has no capacity to manage this. Having said all of that, this this one is more complicated than anything they've attempted. Uh, they, it, I have deep respect for the Federal Reserve, but it is an organization made up of human beings, and uh, human beings are rarely perfect in anything they do. And uh, to some extent, the last three weeks are a good, you know, warning shot about uh, what's possible. The Fed's plan to begin tapering off economic stimulus programs comes with its own set of challenges. How exactly will Mr. Bernanke carry this out? Byron Wien says the way to do it is to let the economy down slowly. My view is, and this is just my view based on my analysis, so this is not a firm fact, three quarters of the monetary expansion goes into financial assets. So that's why the economy is bumping along at 2%. But the stock market was up 15% last year and is up 15% this year. Uh, so the stock market is booming, but the real economy isn't. And the reason is that the money that Bernanke is putting into the economy is largely going into financial assets, keeping interest rates low and stock prices high. I don't think he can stop, but he can slow down. And that's what I think he'll do. But even if he goes from 85 billion a month to 50, 50 is still a lot. 85 billion a month, and you just said that 75% of that goes to primary dealers, it goes to the banks. Isn't that amoral or is it immoral? I don't know. I work in Wall Street. I don't think a lot about morality. I mean, I think that that's a difficult thing. I mean, Wall Street is about money, and a lot of us on Wall Street do good things with the money. But the name of the game is to make as much as possible and, and do it legally, of course. Um, but we don't think about moral issues when we're doing it. And that's exactly what Greg Smith, author of best-selling book, Why I Left Goldman Sachs, says he began to struggle with, conscience and morality. Is it fair to say that the motivation for you writing this letter and then writing the book and then becoming what people have uh, called you as a whistleblower because you saw so much money coming into the sort of banks that you were working for and they weren't doing the right thing with it. In other words, they were causing potential asset bubbles. In the, what people would call the roaring mid-2000s, I think things started getting out of control where you look at how much money banks were making in trading uh, in the 1990s versus the 2000s and revenues in those businesses multiplied by five and tenfold in some cases and what that led to was a huge change in behavior to the point where you can make a lot more money because you can leverage yourself up, you can borrow money much cheaper. Um, banks mentality started changing where they started betting with their own money as opposed to only helping facilitate customers trades. Tell me about algo traders or high frequency traders. A lot of people tell me that a very good percentage of what's going on just a few hundred meters away at the New York Stock Exchange is attributable to what is essentially a bunch of computers. What I think people don't know is today, uh, close to 70% of all trades that go through the exchange are executed by computers or algorithms or the more common term, high frequency trading. And I think the problem with that, we all remember in May of 2010, there was a thing called the flash crash where all of a sudden the market dropped six, seven, eight percent. A lot of stocks dropped to zero. Some stock prices went to 100,000. 
and this was largely attributed to computers just not understanding the psychology of markets and all the liquidity disappeared. And I think the reason individual investors aren't that uh, much rushing to jump back into the markets is this is a fearful thing and it's treacherous terrain to jump in where things like that can happen in this day and age. The markets are addicted to quantitative easing and with the real possibility of a slowdown in economic stimulus on the horizon, there are fears that this could result in considerably lower stock prices down the line, undoing a substantial part of the recovery on the high end of the economic scale ultimately undermining the Fed's entire five-year economic stimulus. But Peter Schiff says the problem is a lot bigger than that. He says the greenback's going to take the fall. What form will the pop take, do you think? Well, eventually, the world's going to figure out the box the Fed is in, that the, that the exit strategy is all talk. And we're going to have a crisis in the dollar. The dollar is going to start to lose a lot of value against other currencies. That's also going to push down uh, the value of U.S. long-term bonds. That's going to force interest rates higher, despite the Fed's desire to artificially restrain them by buying up bonds. And eventually, the Fed is going to be put in a position that it doesn't want to be in, where it has to start raising interest rates, not because the economy is improving, but because inflation is running out of control, and there's a dollar crisis, and the Fed has to do something about it. But because we waited so long and we're so addicted to cheap money, it's going to be catastrophic because now all those banks that were too big to fail that we bailed out, they're going to fail again. Only now they're even bigger. The real estate market is going to have even bigger problems. And the government itself, which has taken on trillions and trillions of dollars of additional debt, thanks to the Fed, is going to have to default on that debt. We're going to have to restructure it because if interest rates go up, the U.S. government can't even service the debt, can't even pay the interest, let alone retire the principal, especially when their tax revenues are drying up in the recession that would result uh, from much higher interest rates. Up next, who's really benefiting from QE? The America that's on the cover of the Wall Street Journal is thriving, but there are entire segments of this population that have not participated at all in the recovery. And SA Reserve Bank Governor Jill Marcus shares her views on quantitative easing. It's a hard pill to swallow that you have to support uh, the, the people who got us into this mess in the first place. But you're not supporting those people, you're supporting the institutions. Mm -hmm.